Hey everybody, good afternoon, good day. I am today interviewing Christine So, the CEO of Umentum. And this is Tosca, of course, at NGO Soul and Strategy. Happy 2022. I want to introduce this interview with Christine a little bit because um, there's a certain context to it. So let me tell you a little bit. Uh, we'll introduce uh, Christine in a moment. Um, as Christine said in an, in an interview, or no, I should say an article in DevEx um, late 2021, there's a lot of aspirational work going on across our INGO sector when it comes to NGOs going through change. But are we really trying to get to the quote unquote sweet spot of translating this thinking into actual operational change and transformation? That was what grabbed me, first of all, and there was a lot more. But in this interview with Christine, and Christine will talk in a moment about the connection between Umentum, the organization that she leads, this article, and the, the CEO discussions that she is drawing from, I will be asking her about what impressions she took away from those set of CEO track discussions across 2021. That was a group of CEOs from a diverse range of organizations who met monthly in 2021 to navigate the changing ING ecosystem. And Christine documented her observations and thought in this DevEx article, which we'll mm. link to in the show notes in late 2020, as I said, mm. and she says, INGOs are not without agency in determining their own operation, operating model and can initiate deep change if they so decide. So I thought, let us talk to Christine and get that bird's eye perspective on the sector level discourse and directions. So let me first <coughs> say welcome to you, Christine. Hi, Tosca. Thank you. It's a pleasure to, to join you. And um... You and I have had a long relationship over many years, and it's fun to be speaking with you today about the latest work that we're doing. Yeah, it's it's definitely fun. And yes, I will be referencing that background that you and I share in a moment. So Christine, for those of you, uh, you who don't know listeners, she's the president and CEO of Umentum. I will ask uh, Christine in a moment um, to explain what Umentum is all about in case you were not yet familiar. She also used to be in her professional past senior director for country programs, especially health at Palladium. Uh, she was the chief operating officer at Population Services International, executive director of the Global Health Council, and Vice President for International Programs at Plan International, and more background in UNICEF, et cetera, which I will not all quote. Yeah. But I will now conclude this bio, Christine, by saying that, um, yes, we share a personal background. Christine and I first knew each other when, Christine, when you participated in the Transnational NGO Leadership Institute, mm -hmm. right? I think it was around 2015 where mm -hmm. that I- No, used it was- it no? was before that. I think it was, was 2012. It? Oh, yeah, you're kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's so, been 10 yes. years. <laughs> I know. Uh, so, and I used to direct that program at Syracuse yeah. University. And at that time, Christine was a senior leader at Plan USA. And I should also say for full uh, transparency that I am an associate at Umentum. What that means is that I occasionally um, do some collaborative work with Umentum. So let's dive in. Christine, tell us about Humentum for those who don't know. Thank you. Um, so Humentum is an organization that works at the sweet spot of translating um, aspirations for international NGOs or transnational NGOs and moving more to working toward with national NGOs as well, mm. translating those visions into operational reality. So we work on um, operating models and operating challenges in particular. Um, we are really active in the areas of financial management, um, compliance and risk management. We do um, learning and delivery and we have an LMS system that many INGOs are using. Um, we work really in um, convening and um, 
co-creating and identifying solutions for the global development sector and the humanitarian sector around how our organizations actually operate to be able to allow these organizations to do their best work in terms of their ultimate missions and impact. Okay, I'm just going to probe deeper for a moment because I think it's really interesting and also worthwhile. You said Umentum is starting to work more with and uh, supporting national NGOs. Yes. So that is a real, really high priority for me. Um, and I was very drawn to Humentum when they were recruiting for a new CEO because the board had a clear vision that they wanted to expand Humentum's reach from our traditional base of working with transnational NGOs, primarily headquartered in uh, North America and in Europe and the UK, and really expand how we provide that same sort of support to um, the growing number of national and local NGOs throughout the world. And we work in particular in Africa. Um, we've done a lot of work also in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and so we are really thinking about how can we bring to bear the expertise, the lessons learned, the best practice um, that we have drawn in working with global donors um, and in the global development community and really help to apply that in a way that speaks to the highest priority needs of national and local NGOs um, who, as you know, are kind of in the spotlight these days because donors are saying that they want to localize the way that they work and where their money is going. Yep. But um, they haven't really figured out what the formula looks like to be able to pr provide that funding in a way that actually empowers local NGOs to um, do the work that they are capable of doing and that they by rights should be the ones doing. Yes, yeah, I think it's a really neat direction. Um, now, one of Umentum's offering is what I'm calling informally the CEO track of discussions, mm -hmm. a series of, of uh, monthly, I believe, right, discussions yes. amongst CEOs of the members of, of Umentum. Tell us a little bit just um, what was the goal, if there was one sure. unifying goal across last year, also how many participated, and can you tell us a little bit of the, the, the profile of, is it CEOs from of all size organizations across sectors or was it uh, was there a certain subsection? Sure. So um, Humentum until the global pandemic, until 2020, held an annual conference every year. Um, we held a lot of in-person convening yeah. and we had to um, transition very quickly in 2020 when the world shut down. Um, because we weren't going to be able to hold our conference. And we really had to rethink how we were working with our um, membership and constituency. And so we launched a series called um, OPEX 365 mm -hmm. uh, that was open to people at all levels of NGO, um, the NGO workforce. But we really wanted to provide a space for CEOs to be able to come together because we knew that people were tackling really thorny and never before seen yeah. challenges. And, you know, as CEOs, the buck stops here, we are responsible. And so we wanted to give them a space to come together and really both have peers who they could discuss these challenges with, but also really start on co-creation of what it means to shift the way that your organization works. Of course, along with the pandemic, we then had the murder of George Floyd in May of 2020 and the whole racial justice movement yeah. and reckoning in the US, but that spread across the world. And I think that that really has contributed to the movement that we have seen happening in parallel around the shift towards locally led development and localization of funding. And um, so all of this together really brought us to know that we needed to provide a space for people where they could be working together. So yeah. we launched this series. It has been monthly. Um, we also throughout 20, I have COVID brain, so <laughs> as bad at calendars as everybody else. Um, through part of 2020, through the summer of 2021, we also had um, quarterly 
online retreats with these CEOs that were, um, you know, more concentrated, longer periods of time with facilitated discussion. Um, <clears throat> we really worked on pretty much, we, we wanted to work on what they were tackling. On their mind in that Yeah, moment. and so some of that was very practical about, you know, it, it went from, um, you know, what are our travel policies these days, like when everything was shutting down, to um, what, are, so our, what are our travel policies as things open up? And um, we worked a lot on um, distributed leadership and what it means to move away from a headquarters structure and think more about how you can work, you know, all of the opportunities and advantages that working um, remotely through you know, technology has given us. I think we hear a lot about the negative side, but there's an awful lot positive that's come out of that as well. Yes. And in terms of profile, um, we really had, we had a core group of about 13 CEOs that really came to everything. Um, we had probably another 10 who would come as they could. And um, we did not have any sort of eligibility criteria. So it wasn't that we had a group for small NGOs and a group for large NGOs. And in fact, what we found was that um, regardless of the size of what they were doing, they really had more in common than they had differences. Good. So well, the, the, the group really gelled and um, built an incredible space of trust and transparency over that time. Nice. And so, of course, we, you, and we have to respect that that uh, the, the the safety of that space. So, obviously, I'm going to ask you only to talk about these kind of generalizable impressions sure. that you took away from uh, from uh, of sitting in in those discussions, right? So, first, if you really pull back a little bit, what were some overriding impressions you took away from those discussions, from your perch as the leader of a national platform organization, yeah. like an international platform organization yeah, like yeah. you meant with. Um, well, I mean, one thing is just that life has been really, really hard since 2020. I mean, it has never been easy to be a CEO. There are lots of challenges um, being at the top of an organization, but um, you know, it has been particularly difficult. And the people that I have been working with care deeply about their organizations, mm. about the communities with whom they were working, and um, they care deeply about their employees and their employees' families. And so, you know, to a person, everyone has been trying to do the right thing. One of the most difficult things is just that there's no playbook for this. And so we don't really know necessarily what the right thing is. Mm. And I think, you know, one of the tensions that I saw people really um, struggling with also was that so, so many of these CEOs or all of these CEOs, even if they happen to be sitting in Washington, D.C. or New York or, or the U.S., they are people who have spent most or much of their professional careers um, outside of the United States working with these communities um, that are the partner communities to the work that they are doing. Um, and it was really hard for them to not be able to see in person their yeah. staff in these communities and in the countries where they work. It was hard for them to not be able to connect directly in the same way that they had with um, the constituencies who partner with their organizations. And that, that was really um, a heart thing for them. That was very hard. Yeah, interesting. Interesting what you immediately emphasize. Um, now, when it comes to the changes that those CEOs in your sessions uh, started to focus on, where did you see the CEOs really lean in on the needs mm -hmm. for change? Well, again, I think the first thing is that people were leaning in just in terms of embracing the idea that going forward, we can't work the way that we've been working in the past. Okay. And again, some of that is just operational stuff. I shouldn't say just, operational stuff is very complicated. Some of that is at the operational level. And some of that is at the ethical and conceptual 
and vision and strategy level. Um, and so that across the board, I think everybody was very much in that space, mm. but they recognized that, you know, and it was clear from the discussions that we were having that each organization is, a, is unique and they're not at the same place. They don't necessarily have the same context or the same history that it has brought them to where they are. And so um, again, we really were looking for commonalities that would help people um, be able to connect and to co-create together. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they were really, they have been, and, and we're seeing um, examples of this increasingly, I think, um, been really leaning into the idea that um, organizations that are traditionally based in high income countries in you know, North America and Europe and the UK, where their work is in low income countries, primarily, and I'm gonna focus on Africa and what I'm saying, um, that they accept that they need to change. Um, and they accept both in terms at the leadership level um, that it, you know, the, the model of having your leadership team all sitting, working in the same office, regardless of where they're from or what they bring to that group, mm -hmm. having them all be physically in the same place um, is actually a constraint and is an, a, an, old, an outdated model. And so they've been thinking through what does it mean to have a distributed leadership model? What does it mean to do global recruitment as opposed to um, you know, geography specific recruitment? Yeah. And um, you know, and then this is where we get involved because it, just the practicalities of, okay, how do I onboard somebody who's coming in at the executive level who I haven't met, I'm not going to be meeting in person, I may not know them, they may not be so, you know, near the other people that they're working with. Um, I mean, I think we are all recognizing that onboarding throughout an organization is difficult, but, you know, when you are shifting towards a distributed leadership model in the midst of a global pandemic, it makes it very challenging. Totally, totally. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. I would add to that, that, you know, then, We've, we've all been re-examining our strategies in part because we've had to and in part because um, that may be, you know, it may, may have already been on the, the schedule to do. But again, you know, I think typically before the pandemic, um, that strategy work was something that we would be doing in person. We would, you know, do it at an offsite retreat or something and with a yeah. facilitator. And, you know, that's an example of how all of these organizations are having to rethink the way that they actually work on these hard things because we don't really have a choice of doing it differently. Yeah. So how, um, to, how to get to the strategy also was different. Yeah. Yeah. Let me let me uh, pick up some of the in the article, the DevEx article, sure. you you mentioned a number of assertions, right? As you call them. So I'm I'm gonna pick up some of these and ask mm -hmm. you to to talk more about it to the extent that you haven't done that already. So you will you said, for instance. And Joe's will shift in purpose and mission away from technical implementation mm -hmm. and towards a role focused on learning and knowledge um, curation, movement building, and advocacy at the global level. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Sounds really interesting. And it's something that a role shift that I've also been really interested to see to what extent we're, we're going to actually see that happen. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, I think that um, lots of INGOs are thinking about what their role should be going forward. Um, and I think, and, you know, I've worked in this in the global development sector for 30 years now. Um, I absolutely think that there is a role for global networks or, you know, whether it's an organization or a network or whatever. Um, sharing across geographies and yes. across lived experience and learned experience and expertise is critical to being able to have um, really dynamic and effective programming and, and um, reaching the goals that we all have in this sector. And I think that it's a perfect example of, you know, the value of diversity. That is diversity yes. in action. 
Yes. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, again, having top down pyramid structured organizations where, um, you know, everyone sits in one place at the top and makes the decisions is an outdated model and it's not acceptable anymore. It, it's not just that it doesn't work anymore, it's not acceptable um, because ultimately that meant, you know, a predominance of white Northern men. Um, in those leadership positions, you know, I come out of the global health field and it, you know, global health is 75% women working in healthcare. Yeah. But if you look at leadership um, until very recently, it was very heavy of, you know, white men in those leadership positions. And that's starting to change, but, um, you know, we, we need to rethink how we are structured and, so, um, you know, and then also, and again, I think the pandemic has really forced us into acknowledging this is that, um, you know, for, for years in global development, there have been myths that structured the way we did things. For example, oh, we can't have people who are native to that particular country being the country director of work because they can't possibly do it in an honest way. They will be besieged by um, temptation to commit fraud. And I'm, you know, I wish I were making that up. I'm not. Or, or the perspective would be, if I may interrupt yeah. for a moment, um, they, uh, they cannot possibly be quote unquote objective as if any of yes, us is, yes, is objective. Yes, right? exactly. And particularly on the campaigning and human rights side. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that is absolutely the case. And, you know, and again, with the pandemic, it forced, I think, the sector into looking at things differently because most of the expats picked up and left and yeah. um, organizations were forced to recognize that their quote unquote national staff were actually perfectly capable of doing the work. The big challenge now has been, does the sector snap back? and just go back to the way things were being done previously now that there is better freedom of movement? Um, or do these organizations embrace the, the, the changes that they were forced into because of the pandemic and really take those as you know, the, the catalyst for rethinking their models and rethinking the way they operate? Yeah, yeah. And that related to something you said in the article, and I think we've we've covered that uh, reasonably well, that organizations you think will move to being, uh, relatively speaking, more hor uh, horizontal, uh, a shift in role and mental model about headquarters, you mentioned that, right? Yeah. And a shift in a shift in autonomy and decision rights. Do you want to say yeah. more about that? Last yeah, that, that's really, really important, because I think that we even before the pandemic, we were seeing what organizations were calling distribution of leadership and mm -hmm. possibly, yeah. you know, having people from the country be the country director or whatever. Oh, yeah. But we weren't necessarily seeing the shifting of authorities, um, the shifting of um, financial management and budget control, mm -hmm. decision making, um, the uh, ability to hire and fire, those things didn't necessarily go with the positions. And I think that is the critical change that we need to be working towards is it's not just having somebody with the face or the profile that you want be that in that leadership position. It's saying we are decentralizing and um, redistributing, letting go of power, you know, there are different terms you can use, yeah. but yeah. saying basically that people working within the context where the work is being done are the ones making the decision. Right. Um, and I will, I'll, I'll mention something which, so I'm, I'm going to seed an idea, which I would love to talk a little bit more about, which is just that, you know, it isn't only about INGOs and NGOs, there are CEOs, it's also about the donors because all of these organizations depend on donor funding, where, whether it's individual donors or um, philanthropy or government donors. Um, and they have lots of rules and lots of, they yeah. decide the way things work to yeah. a great extent. 
Yeah, and so they they will definitely co-influence that, that, that direction. But as you are argued in the article, NGOs have some agency there, right? We do, definitely. And yes. that's a, and I know that you meant also had, plays a role, an important role in influencing and advocating with donors for yeah. changes around yes. operational policies. But yeah, let's let's for now stick with the with with the article. Another interesting aspect that I thought is is uh, you you foresee changes in career pathing and jobs. Mm -hmm. That's of yeah. course often on on a lot of people's minds, right? Yeah, so. yeah. Well, I mean, again, um, I think you know at the CEO level, we're all thinking about what is my role going forward. Where is the appropriate place for me? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of us are faced with the question, should I be stepping aside to give space for somebody else to move into this kind of role? And when is it the right time to do that? And how do you do it? Um, so I think that definitely is at the, the you know, kind of senior level. But um, also, and, and actually, I, I just want to say that I have seen an increasing trend towards what I would call different kinds of um, appointments hmm. at leadership level. It's really exciting. I am seeing this and, and I think that's good. Talk more about that, will you? Well, I just, I saw somebody, um, you know, announced on LinkedIn the other day who is someone who's, you know, not from the U.S., is from Africa, but is being appointed into a headquarters level, very senior executive job. Um, and, you know, I, I think we're seeing more of that. And but wouldn't you say, though, I, I, I do think sure. we see more of that too, but that has been a longer term development amongst some NGOs, wouldn't you say? about Some that? NGOs, but not you all think, of them. Yeah. You think much more selectively than what it is now, what you're yeah. you yeah. saying. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 um, that. Yeah. But I also just want to say the other thing, which, which I think is really, there's no good answer for this, again, mm -hmm. going to this idea of career paths, is that, you know, there are a lot of people, I'll pick on the U.S., there are a lot of people in the U.S., a lot of young people who want to be involved in making the world a better place Absolutely. and being involved in global development. Um, and 30 years ago, when I was in graduate school, there was a clear, I kind of itinerary that I could follow and have this career. And yeah. I would be filling spaces where there wasn't abundant technical ability right. um, for colonial reasons. Um, today, that's no longer the case. And I think it is difficult for people who are you know, in college and coming out of college and thinking about what they want for their career yeah. to figure out where they fit. And that is, and, and I don't think there's a good answer to that at this point. I, I'm so glad that you're being honest about that, Christine, because I feel exactly the same. Yeah. And there is no good answer to that. That's something maybe for a, another podcast episode, but it is on my mind as well. Um, you also said in the article that uh, HQs will shift to providing support services and funding support mm -hmm. rather than housing all decision making. We've talked a little bit about the decision making and uh, you talked about the shifting of power, etc. That that shift in role of whatever what will be called maybe not headquarters, but something else in the future to providing support services. Is there anything from an, thinking about Umentum's oper excellence or th their specialization in operational excellence? Is there something that comes to mind there that you wanna share? Well, I mean, again, I think it's really um, having org helping organizations to think through what are the critical functions that they have within their organization? And then what is the best way to organize those functions? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I think it is appropriate that we are moving away from a quote unquote headquarters approach. Um, and, you know, we are definitely seeing organizations that are, again, um, distributing the, the people who would traditionally sit in their headquarters leadership team that they are looking at having global teams and who work remotely and work through Zoom and that you know is the way that they've structured. I know other organizations that are looking at, you know, they're perhaps the the 
office that used to be their headquarters office in Washington, D.C., for example, now becomes their primary office for advocacy and fundraising with the U.S. government because mm -hmm. the geography, the geographic relationship makes sense. Mm -hmm. But they may decide to, um, you know, relocate other functionalities to other places. And, you know, I can say that when I was working in these organizations, you know, we were always struggling with the fact that we had our technical experts, quote unquote, sitting in Washington, D.C., and they were on airplanes all the time. Yeah. You know, and it was like, first of all, that you know, that's perpetuating a parachute approach to technical assistance. Um, I think in terms of climate, we all feel that, you know, mm -hmm. we have been, again, forced to really confront a reality about our, our carbon footprint. Yeah. Um, in terms of our budget, does it make sense to spend so much money on plane tickets and, you know, shoot, dropping people in places rather than actually working on um, developing and identifying the technical expertise that already exists in those places. Um, I think the other thing that's very important to me is I do believe that some leaders get stuck when they try to take the existing traditional definition of their technical expert or their compliance expert or whatever mm -hmm. and say, okay, now we're going to do exactly the same thing, but in a different geography. Right. And then they can't find the person with exactly the profile they want. And so they say, oh, we tried, can't do it. Going back. Right. And nothing back. What, and, and, how I like to look at this and how I encourage people to look at it is to really think of it as, okay, what are you ultimately trying to change? What is the difference you want to see? And then work it back from there. And if you find that you are not getting the person that you feel you need, think differently about what that profile, how you constructed that profile. Think differently about the kinds of questions you're asking. Um, and, you know, I think one of a kind of simple example of this, but one that is, um, I wish more organizations would adopt as a matter of course is, you know, for example, if you look at jobs that are advertised frequently, you will see jobs requiring a bachelor's degree, the four-year you know, US university degree, <laughs> when in fact, you can look at that and you say, Do, but does this job really need that? Hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll give an extreme example, but you, know, you could be wanting to hire somebody to do um, you know, to help with course registration for an online course that's being offered and you're asking for a bachelor's degree and you need to step back and say, do I need a bachelor's degree for that? Mm -hmm. Could we just look at equivalent experience? Can we think differently about the kinds of competencies that we want that person to have? And more and specifically. Think, mm -hmm. Right, and think more about competency rather mm -hmm. than these traditional parameters that yeah. frankly have served to exclude people from being able to- I was gonna say this job. is of course, yeah. um, what you just said uh, is, is directly related to diversity, equity, inclusion, right? Yeah, exactly. We, as a kind of uh, white staff in the majority in NGOs define certain technical expertise and then we're saying, okay, now we're going to find an expertise somewhere else, but it has to be basically in our mind, at least that's an, an unspoken belief system that we need to kind of interrogate assume we're looking for a copycat, right? When actually yeah. uh, that's not, uh, that's, you know, as academics like to call it, that's isomimicry. That is kind of trying to replicate what you have in, in yeah. other settings. And that is actually defeating the very purpose uh, yeah. or part of the purpose. Yeah. Now, um, I do want to, um, so going back to what you told us about uh, um, distributed 
leadership and distributed decision making, decision yeah. rights, right, and greater autonomy to the to the local level. I'm wondering if the CEOs and you meant them. Um, staff and leaders like yourself who are in the room with them thought about the lessons that some NGOs particularly confederated and federated uh, mm. large global particularly uh, 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 campaigning organizations I'm thinking about the Oxfam's amnesties green pieces etc of this world who have been trying to already before the pandemic move it towards that and have to in some ways succeeded but have also found that there is a lot of new trade-offs that come up then, right? Oh, yeah. New conundrums. And I don't want to, I'm simplifying that, but for instance, one of them is that it increases, for instance, it can be harder than to be globally cohesive, right? Around a global agenda. It can, the transaction cost, the amount of intra-organizational coordination that needs to happen and mm -hmm. the consultation and deliberation, et cetera, increases even more. And we know that NGOs are already often, in my view, overly internally focused, right? And not sufficiently focused on the outside world and what is changing and how we either have to influence that or how we have to adopt. Did the CEOs incorporate those kind of real life experiences as they considered how to push down decision rights? They did, definitely. And um, I mean, again, I'll go back to the point I made earlier just about, you know, kind of each organization being unique. Yeah. Um, you know, if there were a gold standard, silver bullet, perfect model, whatever you want to call it for yeah. this, we wouldn't all be struggling with it because lots of really smart, very experienced people are trying to figure this out. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and having worked in a federated organization and having worked at UNICEF, which is also in a lot of ways federated, excuse me, I have a pandemic puppy who- Yes, <laughs> yes, it's all right. Is making himself known. Um, so, you know, it's really, it is really difficult. And I think that, um, you know, where I end up is that there are lots of different models out there. We don't have a perfect model. And, you know, if I think about the um, organizations, the CEOs that I was working with and that I'm working with now and their organizations, the models that they are working through really span a wide spectrum. I see. Some of them are looking at, um, you know, thinking about a, a more federated model, some of them are saying, no, we really have to stay how we are because we have a very deep history with our donors and they would not be okay with changing that. Right. Um, we have organizations that are saying, you know, we're not going to be federated, but we are going to that distributed decision-making and authorities um, models. So we are still one organization, but we've got you know everybody sitting everywhere. So there are a lot of ways that people are working through this. And um, I think one of the things that is so important and frankly that I'm so pleased that um, Humentum can provide is that we do give that space for convening for you know, people at all levels of the organization, but especially, you know, CEOs, CFOs, COOs, everybody in the C-suite, um, <laughs> to be able to come together and share their experiences and think through, you know, what's working, what isn't. Um, and, and that provides a space for taking things to the next level and not just kind of trying to create this in your... In within internally within your own right. organization, right, um, right, yeah. yeah. Well, because your puppy is adamant about <laughs> about wanting to um, have some attention, I'm gonna kind of tie two questions uh, together and ask if you could just give a short answer because sure. otherwise you probably you will get in trouble with your puppy. <laughs> uh, uh, you did say in the article also organizations aiming more for flexible funding and getting off the tre oh. treadmill of project funding. So yes. a quick answer to how is that related to these broader trends? Well, I mean, I, th you know, form or function follows form follows function. Yeah. Um, I think in, in our case, it's form follows donors and, um, you know, we, 
we have whole organization, we, we have, you know, a whole industry that is really built to receive funding from particular donors. In our case, I mean, I'll, I'll focus on USAID because that is what so many of our organizations um, receive. But also if you talk to organizations that are, for example, don't get government funding, they get philanthropy funding, um, you know, they have built their organizations to be able to correctly be set up to receive that funding and yep. then execute. And so um, I think, you know, one piece of this that has been talked about for a long time has been the length of the funding cycle, mm. typically three to five years. And the fact that that does not allow for um, the development of, you know, true partnerships and it really hampers the work between international organizations and local and national organizations. Um, you know, there is a trade-off. The U.S. government has, you know, prioritized competition at the price of con continuity and consistency. I see. For example. So, you know, well, Yes, it's a three-year funding cycle, and we're going to rebid this at the end of three years, and you must have local partners, but all of those local partners must be vetted, and they must meet the same criteria that international partners meet, because we can't possibly be, you know, looser or more, or think outside of the box in terms of our, those partnerships. Yeah. So, you know, we... I think that we have a tendency to feel like, well, this is the way it is. And so things have to be built to, to respond exactly. to that. And actually, I think we should take a step back and say, well, we had chosen to prioritize these things, but maybe we need to think about prioritizing these things. Instead. Because the one thing cannot happen without the other, yes. right? Because it's it is a trade-off. It yeah. is a trade-off, and there has to be some uh, alignment, at least in the in the medium term. Otherwise, yeah. that's going to keep um, fighting, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, last question before I ask you where people can find out more about you, can you say something in general? Where did you see CEOs shrink back? Where did you see them? look the other way or maybe there are good reasons not to yeah change. i i would say it's much more that i okay. didn't see anybody say like oh i just can't deal with this i'm not going to think about it what i did see was again ceos very deeply thinking through the balance between for example their commitment to their individual donor base people and families who have been contributing to help their organization do its work for decades, through yeah. generations of families and saying, I can't disband my organization and create a local organization because we have this commitment to these people. Um, that's just one kind of random example. Yeah. But, um, but I think it's, it is, that CEOs are really looking at, you know, how do I hit the right balance? How do I, you know, how far can I go? Um, you know, it's very destabilizing to tell an organization that you're gonna completely transform the way they work and the way they exist and that their jobs are going to be moving to a different geography. And if those people don't wanna to move to that geography or can't move it or are not supposed to move to that geography, that they're out. Yeah. So they're, you know, I think that's the kind of thing where CEOs, um, sometimes it's safer to go a little slower, to take a little step back. Um, but I will say that I, I would say on the whole, I work with really courageous people who understand the complexities mm. and are really trying to do the right thing. Um, you know, we all flub up sometimes. We all can yeah. have great, great intentions and still get it wrong sometimes. But I think for that group and for me as the CEO of Humentum and the way that Humentum tries to work is 
really thinking about accountability and transparency. And, you know, if, if we make a mistake, we're going to try and own that mistake and recognize it and do better. Um, and I would say that was very much the spirit of the CEOs I was working with. Including about how to both conceive and implement this change. I hear you. Absolutely. Say, yeah. Absolutely. No, nobody, nobody has the right answer. So we're all kind of trying to get through it together. Right, right. Well, Christine, so if people want to learn more about you and about the benefits of considering a membership of Umentum or other, uh, in other forms of partnership with Umentum, where should they go? Well, we have a website, um, humentum.org. And um, I'm excited because we redid our website um, and relaunched it in the fall of 2021. And it's great. And I think it really reflects where we're at and what we're trying to do. Um, and I would really encourage people to check out our course offerings, which are also open to non-Humentum members. Check out our membership, which is, uh, we do organizational memberships. Um, and then we have a learning platform called HLS, which is again, a separate offering. So um, if you are in an organization that needs learning resources and a platform, check that out. Um, and then finally, I'll just say that we are really um, increasing and um, in increasing our offering and increasing our priority or, or raising our priority of um, the convening that we're doing and the operational and administrative advocacy that we are doing um, between the, the members of the sector and donors in particular. And so we have a lot of really exciting stuff coming out in terms of thought leadership, in terms of convening opportunities um, and opportunities to participate in all of that. So, okay. um, and, and that is that is a direction that we've been going over the last couple of years. And so people who knew Humentum before I'll just stress that that is um, they need something. to re rethink yeah. uh, what uh, and have a look uh, again. Yeah, what, exactly, uh, exactly. What, what you meant to offer. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you. I was really um, intrigued by your article in DevEx, and again, we will um, link that in in the, the show notes. And so, thank you, Christine, for all your insights. It's been always great to talk with somebody who has a bird's eye view of, of the sector. I appreciate that. And thank you, listeners. If you found this podcast uh, stimulating, be sure to check out the other ones of my podcast. In fact, next week, we are launching a series of three podcast episodes with MZ MZN International, mm -hmm. uh, a German-based but international boutique consulting firm in the mm -hmm. international development space. And uh, Chris, the founder, and I will have a couple of interesting, provocative discussions around chasing innovation, chasing funding, and chasing impact. So we hope you'll, um, you'll join us for that. And also, um, uh, as it happens, Christine pointed out the virtual ways of working, how they are going to be more, uh, ever more prevalent as we've all become accustomed to them in the last two years and some even well before that, of course. So um, on my website, fiveoaksconsulting.org, you'll find more information about um, uh, a new free mini course called Five uh, steps to turbocharge your virtual team leadership, as well as a full course that is fee-based um, post-pandemic virtual team leadership essentials. We'll hope you'll check that out, fiveoaksconsulting.org. And with that, I know your team will thank you. And this is Tosca, and I look forward to spending time with you on NGO Soul and Strategy next time. <laughs>